Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Globalization has been seen as signaling the death of the nation state. People have been talking about the end of the era of the nation state, the demise of the nation state. So it's time we start looking at what globalization has entailed for the nation state. We did talk about the political aspects of globalization and one of the major impacts of globalization politically has been the future of the nation state. Uh, we also saw that uh, with in the new space of postmodernity, which is a space of boundaries rather than borders and of discontinuous spaces, uh, the, the state-centric division of space, which was seen as natural in the past, doesn't seem to be the norm anymore. In, in view of the reality of uh, frequent uh, reality of the frequency of border crossings, so let's let's, let's explore uh, the question. Let's um, try to investigate, inquire into the question: What does globalization mean for the nation state? I'll talk about two things before ex before going into uh, what globalization means for the nation state. Let's begin by defining what the nation state is and then we'll proceed to what, what has happened to the nation state in the era of globalization. Uh, we look at um, particularly with the case uh, examples of uh, case study of India, we have some quick images of how the nation, Indian nation was imagined. And there were different imaginings of the nation, and these imaginings of the nations were buried against the master narrative of the nation, and these content discontents of the nations are now finding a voice in the era of globalization. What is a nation? A nation is a spiritual principle resulting from the profound complications of history, a spiritual family and not a group de determined by the configuration of the land. Now the idea of the nation state, we need to distinguish between the nation state and the nation, although we talk to talk about them in the same breath as if they were one and the same. Nation state is something new in history, but the idea of nation is not really new. because. It comes from Nietzsche. The idea of is of a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, a language, inhabiting a particular state or territory derived from natus of birth. So, although the nation state is new, the nation is not a new, is not a new idea. What is a nation? And how does the principle of nationality differ from the principle of race and or dynasty as it was practiced in the nations of the past? Modern nation, we would say, is a historical result brought about by a series of phenomena converging in the same direction. It is based on unity, dynasty, will and general sensibility. What are the principles? Let us examine the principles along which a nation can exist. So, the most common uh, principle along which nations have been uh, organized in the past is primordial right. Like if you always lived in a place and uh, you are born there or your ancestors were born there, you seem to have a primordial right to a nation. The nations could be based on race. Uh, they could be based on language, such as the European nationalisms, for instance, were all 
linguistic nationalisms and they were based on nations were di divided along the lines of language. They could be um, on the basis of geography, for instance, uh, the territorial boundaries or a particular regional location. They could be based on communities of interest. So, what, uh, what we should understand is that nation can be based on any principle. Depend, uh, the, the number of or the principles along which na a nation can be based can be in are it really infinite. One can base a nation on any principle under the earth. But in order to understand what a nation is, what we must understand that a nation is a soul. It is a spiritual principle and it is an outcome of a long sacrifice and de devotion. It entails expression of solidarity, but it is not eternal. So, there are two parts to the nation, to the imagining of the nation. One is the old memories, the past memories and the second is actual consent. What does a nation need to come into being? First, there has to be a common memory, an affirm a memory to which a commu the community of the nation can return and the second is the actual consent to be, to form a community, the desire to live together. So, Renan defines a nation as one a great aggregate of men, of sound spirit, of and warm heart and creates a moral conscience that is a nation. Nation, the most influential idea in the understanding of the nation state is that of a Benedict Henderson in his book, book Imagine Communities. In Imagine Communities, uh, Benedict ben, uh, Edison pointed out that any community larger than a face to face village community is essentially imagined. That is what the title signals to that any community is not given organic, but it is imagined. And then he proceeds to define the nation. Now, prior to that, we had Ernest Gellner who had also spoke, tried to at attempt to define na the nation and in his view, nationalisms invents nations where they do not exist. Essentially, uh, Anderson is building on Gellner's idea of nations as imagined, nations as a myth, nations as nation as an invention and something uh, which is imagined which does not exist. So, Primarily, it is a principle which holds that the political and nation and the national unit should be congruent and that is what gives birth to the nation state. So, now this idea that nation is not organic, it is not given, it is not always been there, it is not an essence, but it is something which is produced, it is a narrative, it is a myth, it is an invention. This is a mind boggling discovery in our understanding of the nation. As uh, many of us believe that nation has always been nation, the nation state has always been there. Everyone must always belong to the na uh, to a nation. We belong to a particular nation. So, those ideas of ours are challenged by these uh, un new understandings of the nation, new, new explanations of the idea of the nation state given by people like by theorists of the nation like uh, Ernest Kellner and Benedict Anderson. Now, let us uh, try to understand uh, the, the key terms in Anderson's definition of the nation. First of all, he says the nation is imagined, which means as he puts it, members will never know most of their fellow members, yet in the minds of each la lives the image of their communion. So, uh, when uh, we think of ourselves as inhabiting a nation, you might not never have met someone who is part of the nation or are not likely to meet in that person all our lives. And yet, there is the sense of community, a sense of community which is produced uh, through the sp public sphere and as Anderson rightly put it, uh, it it came into being with the invention of the printing press, where a community of people could congregate in the 
in the space of the newspapers and imagine themselves as a com community, as a group. The nation, according to Anderson, is limited, which means even the largest of them has finite, if elastic, boundaries beyond which lie other nations. So, a uh, nation cannot be a vague, amorphous, porous, permeable boundary, in, in uh, uncertain boundary. It must have a, uh, a certain limit. So, it is always finite, it is uh, limited. And finally, the uh, sorry, uh, the, the third aspect of the nation is that it's sovereign. The concept of nation, the concept of the nation was born in an age in which enlightenment and revolution were destroying the legitimacy of the divinely ordained hierarchical dynastic realm. Nations dream of being free and if under God, directly so. So, the nation is sovereign. And finally, the nation is a community. It is always conceived as a deep horizontal com comradeship. So, these aspects of the nation are very uh, interesting that nation even though it is a narrative, it is a narrative which is brought into being through, the ima through imagination, it is an imagined community, it is an invented community, it is not given, it is produced, it is produced by consent and yet it invites such loyalty it is sanctified by ties of blood. So, uh, what it needs is a common memory, an affirmation of a certain past, a certain hoary past uh, uh, around which people, uh, uh, the community which defines itself as a nation congregates to produce itself as a new nation state. Now, having understood the idea of the nation, uh, the the idea of the nation itself, there is a progression from Gellner to Anderson, because in Gellner's idea, there is a suggestion that nations are, there is something artificial about the idea of the nation being an invention, that is something fabricated. But in Anderson's idea, uh, in the, the use of the word imagining instead of inventing, makes it a more organic kind of uh, imagining and a more positive understanding of the invented or the produced aspect of the nation. Now, uh, so to summarize uh, what I have said so far, I have tried to define the nation and I have tried to show how the nation states or the state centric division of space which we take as natural is not, has not always been there. It is a comparatively recent invention. It is a product of, of the modern era when the whole world was divided into a series, carved into a series of nation states. And with globalization, uh, if we read it together with the idea of the space of the nation state as or end of modernity as discontinuous and the state of space of modern postmodernity as continuous bound uh, orus, we find that the, the era of the nation state seem to be uh, mainly one phase in the history of civilization or the history of the world, which seems to be coming to an end in the views of some scholars and the views of some theorists of globalization. Uh, but it is almost the more than quarter of a century since people have been portending the death of the nation state and seeing the dirge of the impending demise of the nation uh, state and yet the nation state continues to survive, it continues to live on. So, let us now uh, examine the question, has the nation state become extinct or does it still have any relevance? So, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, the nation state has, uh, the power of the nation's nation state has, has been undermined, severely undermined in the era of globalization for two reasons. Uh, for the threats to the nation state from without and from within. And the, these threats from without constitute the th threats from transnational formations. I am not talking about transnational corporations alone, but transnational formations which increasingly have an, a role in the governance of the world as compared to the past. And the emergence of micro-nationalist movements which threaten the unity of the nation from within. 
Now, the emergence of these new power structures in the global era, the international organizations as well as transnational corporations, they have severely restricted the sovereignty and, the and reduced, diminished the power of the nation states. But have they really become extinct is the question. In the view of Saskia Sassen, one, uh, the nation state has not really ended, but there has been a transformation in the idea of the nation state in the sense that expansion of the privatization and marketization of the public sector functions in a number of countries has resulted in a global concept of regulation as efficiency. Now, because of this, the ideal of the regulatory state has given way to the competitive state whose norm is to maximize efficiency. So, in other words, the nation state is not dead, only the idea of the nation state seems to have been altered through its transforming from a regulatory state to the competitive state. Uh, sorry, the idea of the nation state uh, has changed in the present era. Now, uh, while others feel that the nation state has been largely marginalized in the era of globalization, among them we may name uh, Prabhat Patnaik, who says that the rise to dominance of financial or rentier interests and the fluidity of finance across national bounder borders which we saw was enabled through the, uh, the flows of uh, money across the space of flows in as defined by Manuel Castells in Arjuna Padurai's idea of finance capes. And according to Patnayak, Prabhat Patnayak, this the fluidity of finance has undermined has undermined the control area of nation states and made all agendas of state intervention appear vacuous. And this has led, according to him, to the integration of the world into a single economic system after globalization has considerably weakened the sovereignty of the nation state. So, as I said right at the beginning, we cannot really separate the economic from the political or the political from the cultural or the economic from the cultural when we talk about globalization because each aspect of globalization, the communicational, the political, the economic and the cultural, they all seem to be uh, interwoven. So, uh, the, the formation, the globalization of the economy for instance has also had a Im political impact, a uh, very uh, significant political impact in terms of the diminishing power of the nation state. Now, um, there has been a reordering of political hierarchies with, with, uh, with the emergence of these uh, new powers in the global era. The first is that what, what he Patnaik, Prabhat Patnaik calls denationalization of statehood or the transfer of power located at the national territorial level in two ways. How does this denationalization of statehood takes place? It takes place first because there is a transfer of power upwards to supra regional or international bodies and on the other hand it is also downwards to regional or local states and outwards to autonomous cross national alliances. So, we can see in the case of India uh, the increasing power of the region in the era of the uh, nation state and uh, not just the increasing power of the region and this power of the region comes from the transnational alliances that regions are able to uh, form across national borders uh, le uh, say the, uh, the the consolidation of of uh, Sikh uh, of uh, Sikh nationalism which is uh, which is transnational rather than national which is both regional and transnational. Similarly, the idea of the Tamil Elam, 
the, the new idea of the trans nation or a new nation which are emerging because of the transfer of power downwards. The second aspect of this or reordering of political hierarchies is the process of destatization or the transfer of particular activities to parastatal, non-governmental, commercial, not-for-profit profit actors and institutions or regimes. So, according to Alan Wood, the world today is more than ever a world of nation states. It is not the nation states as do not seem to have disappeared from the world because capital requires is still uh, uh, the, the idea of the free market or gro global capitalism which is presumed on the, uh, the, the notion of the non-interference of the state is really a myth because global capitalism is nationally still nationally org organized and irreducibly dependent on na national states. So, the nation state is far from dead. So, we conclude with posing the final question, will the nation state survive globalization? And Martin Wolf has the answer. Martin Wolf dispel fears about globalization as destroying government's capacity to do they, what they, they want or need, particularly in areas of taxation, public spending and macroeconomic policy. He says that states have not really becoming, become redundant in the global era for a number of reasons. One is since capitalism operates in a social and political context, the structures of the state that provide these frameworks are absolutely essential for economic activities. And two, identities of people converge on states and finally, states guarantee stability that is the bedrock of international order. So, we may safely conclude that uh, the fact that cooperation and regulation are required as a consequence of the complex and transnational nature of contemporary global issues has led scholars to announce the death of the nation state. Some of these believe that the state will adjust to globalization while others believe that it will play an active role and some believe that it will die. Uh, Let us look at some concrete examples to, uh, to inquire what has happened to the nation state. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, conspicuous examples uh, about the impending death of the nation state is the, is the, is the example of the idea of Khalistan which uh, Arjun Apadurai uh, said that offers a new kind of uh, post uh, Westphalian formation. Uh, it as an example of a micro-nationalist movement uh, which, which has a history uh, before in uh, which dates back whose history dates back to, to the era before independence in the, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. But which really an idea which really emerged in the diaspora because the, the renewed call for Khalistan was uh, made in the diaspora rather than the nation and it was events in the nation such as the storming of the golden temple operation uh, in the in operation blue star and the anti Sikh riots after the assassination of the prime minister, the former prime minister Indra Gandhi that created that alienated the Sikhs not only within India, but more so in the diaspora who uh, and this alienation of Sikhs particularly in the diasporas who had no real um, insight into events at uh, to the into the ground realities were uh, ha large were highly influenced by images of tortured Sikhs on uh, Sikh websites, S uh, images of tortured Sikhs circulated on newly formed Sikh websites on the internet and these internet images of atrocities against the Sikh 
along with the virtual communities and the possibilities of communication between Sikhs across the world allowed, uh, uh, enabled the formation, you know, the renewal of this, uh, the desire for Khalistan, a desire which dates back to an earlier era, but which was uh, consolidated, which was mobilized through internet te technologies, through new media technologies, consolidated in the virtual spa space, and it became a reality. So when the demand for Khalistan was uh, renewed, it was, it was the diaspora which led this movement for the formation of Khalistan. And uh, uh, it also exam offers an example of a, of a nation without a territory, because it's a geography without territory, as Apadurai puts it, because the, the reality, uh, I mean, it's only an idea, and an idea which uh, unites Sikhs across the world, but it doesn't really, uh, it hasn't been uh, given a material uh, shape up to now, because all those who are talking about Khalistan, what exactly will be the boundaries of Khal Khalistan, what areas it would comprise of, those ideas are still very airy fairy. These don't seem to have been formalized, uh, formulated clearly, and yet the idea. So this example of uh, a nation of, Kal of uh, Khalistan seems to point to new communities uh, of, the pa of, the, uh, of the future, whether they become a reality or not, but they offer the possibilities of new communities which are regional, at the same time they are transnational. And they are communities which, were, which can really bypass national boundaries because the connecti conne con connectedness between uh, Sikhs in Punjab and the Punjabi Sikh diasporas overseas uh, seem to bypass the national boundaries and the, the imagination of a Sikh nation which is based not on terri territory or physical space or spatiality, but on uh, uh, on everyday practices, on uh, uh, on certain uh, uh, gurus, on the idea, the uh, on religion, on religious identities, on certain s holy places, on certain everyday practices, rather than a physical space. So all these point to the new idea of the, the shape that the new sh nation state, even if we think that it dies, might take in the future where it is disengaged from territory, it's disengaged from its physical speciality, and it is transnational in the sense it's virtual, it may not exist in reality at all, and it's transnational that it may be formed across uh, existing national boundaries. And similarly, we have other examples, for, in, for instance, the idea of the Tamil Elam, which brought, which was again transnational and regional in the sense that it united Tamils within India and Tamils within Sri Lanka, with Tamils across the world. So e the idea of the Tamil Elam as the idea of Khalistan offer similar ideas of the transnational, transnation or the post-nation which is, which is uh, possibly an idea of the shape that the nation might assume it at some future day. Similar, the other aspect of, um, uh, uh, other than micronationalist, the transnationalist uh, idea of nation, uh, the nation state is, uh, is best exemplified by the power of the transnational corporation. The transnational corporation, uh, which Baba has memorably named Mac, the, the world formed by the transnational corporation, which Baba has memorably named Macworld, again shows how the economic clout of the transnational, uh, the, the economic power of the transnational corporation under, uh, undermines the sovereignty of the nation state and how the transnational corporation does not really see the nation state, uh, the world in terms of nation states, but only in terms of s localities or sites disregarding the boundaries of nation state, except 
when it, uh, it obstructs its own movements. Other than that, it seems to look at uh, nation states as mere obstacles in its worldwide uh, spread. So the, the, the world created, I mean the nation created according to the transnational corporation, the MAC world, um, is again another uh, alternative to the nation which undermines the authority or sovereignty of the nation state due to the increasing power of the transnational corporation economically because of the globalization of the economy. And um, one talks about how uh, the Coca-Cola and company, for instance, or McDonald and company are not a, a national com multinational company, but they are a local company with many offices. So this kind of rhetoric which transnational corporations use to conquer and uh, to, to conquer new territories, new markets, uh, creates a dystopic nation, a commodified nation in which uh, people get uh, disengaged from the special speciality of the nation states to see themselves as belonging to particular organization, particular corporations, to a new world, commodified world created by the transnational corporation rather than uh, the the uh, rather than the political nation state when people say oh they uh, they uh, when they talk about the culture of uh, the google culture or the microsoft culture or yahoo culture uh, they seem to th distance themselves from the, you know, the 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 material space or the material uh, identities or um, material realities of the nation spaces, nation states within which they actually live. So with this, uh, we conclude the section on uh, the nation state and how the nation state's power has been increasingly diminished by, the, by two factors. One, through the emergence of transnational organizations, not just transnational corporations, because it's these transnational corporation organizations uh, which seem to have increasingly uh, uh, increasing power in the governance of the planet. They seem to have planetary powers and the, the nation states are governed uh, not by any particular transnational corporation but um, juridical procedures which uh, masquerade as objective procedures which are uh, really created by transnational corporations to which nation states are expected to bow down, to kowtow to and uh, uh, which really govern the economies and the sovereign, uh, the control the sovereign, uh, undermine or diminish the authority of nation states even in their own internal matters. And secondly, the um, emergence of the micronationalist movements would seem to have received a new fillip with the, through the support they have received from transnational corporations, through the support they have, uh, and through the, their ability to uh, mobilize themselves globally through new, new and improved communication technologies, makes us uh, rethink the idea of the nation state, if not announce the death of the nation state.